Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm the Director of Portfolio Management here at TRICOM. As an administrative and financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member of the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, TRICOM was pleased to launch the Industry Insider Webinar Series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is Alan Gilbert with Essential Staff Care. Alan serves as a liaison between Insurance Applications Group and their payroll processing and funding partners and staffing specific software partners. With more than 25 years of experience in the professional services field, Alan has an extensive background in HR workforce solutions and payroll services. He holds a double major in business administration and insurance and economic securities from the University of South Carolina and is a South Carolina licensed life and health agent. Essential Staff Care is the largest benefits program for temporary agencies in the nation. Now with over 100 or 1,000 staffing companies as clients, processing over 1 million applications annually, ESC has been recognized as one of the fastest growing businesses from Inc. Magazine's 55,000 for the last six years consecutively. Fulfilling a campaign promise, President Trump went to work on a bill to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. On May 4th, 2017, the House passed legislation to substantially overhaul the ACA with the introduction of the American Health Care Act, and the bill is now headed to the Senate where it will require both Republican and Democratic votes to pass. In today's edition of the Industry Insider Webinar Series, Alan with Essential Staff Care will cover where the current repeal and replace efforts stand and how various outcomes will impact the staffing industry. Topics covered include repeal and replace status, proposed changes, review of various outcomes, and the impact on the staffing industry. By the end of this session, you'll be up to date with the efforts to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act and how the various outcomes could affect your staffing business. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature or the chat feature located on your right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. Please welcome Alan. Alan, are you there? I am. I'm sorry, man. I had my uh, my mute button on. I want to thank you for uh, allowing us to uh, to participate in today's presentation, and also want to certainly thank those that are taking time out of what I know are busy schedules to uh, to visit with us today. Um, um, Amanda, the only thing I'm not cons I'm not sure of is advancing the slide. How do I do that? I got the controls, but I. Don't know advance the slide. Who's that? Yes. No. Yeah. No. Nope. That's Amanda. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, Amanda. Yes, I can. Uh, it looked like you advanced the slide by um, pressing the arrow. If you go ahead and do that again. There but you that, go. It took, oh, 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 oh! I see what you've done. Is Okay. All right. Sorry about that. I uh, I just didn't I didn't know you had moved that one slide to the beginning. All right. Um, well, again, thanks everybody for participating today, and and I guess the overall message that we have is, um, you know, the ACA is still the law of the land. Uh, it will be, and until it's not, um, and while we saw a relatively quick passage in the House. We certainly can't expect a similar uh, outcome in the Senate. There's far too many issues at hand and, and uh, different stakeholders, and I think what we'll see is a, a much more drawn-out process. But kind of in a review as to where we are today, um, on May 4th of 2017, the U.S. House of Representatives, of course, approved the version of the American Health Care Act 
Um, their version of it would no longer require employers to offer group health insurance, and nor would it require individuals to carry insurance. So the House version, as it passed the House, does in fact have the essentially the repeal, if you will, of the two mandates that have been uh, the core frustration for a lot of people uh, as it relates to this bill. Uh, under this bill, uh, what we know today as being subsidies, uh, for instance, for individual coverage through the exchange, those subsidies would be actually replaced with individual credits for individuals to purchase uh, credits or um, coverage on the open market. Um, it, it, there is one very interesting perspective that we need to recognize that is in the current House bill. Um, it reverses essentially the, the idea of a MEC offering. Uh, many of you that are on this phone have, uh, or on this presentation have in fact utilized the MEC strategy for your ACA compliance. And certainly until there's some changes, that continues to be a compliant plan. The biggest difference is if the House version today were to pass the Senate, in its current form, it would essentially reverse the MEC plan um, and it would, it would create a situation where an employee that was offered a MEC plan could not receive um, a subsidy or in this case, a tax credit. So, uh, you know, the reason why the MEC plan was so attractive to a lot of our clients was that by offering a MEC plan, you in fact met your individual mandate, um, but it didn't disrupt an employee or prevent an employee from actually receiving subsidies in the marketplace. So that's an interesting change um, if the law was passed in its current form, which is uh, probably pretty unlikely. Uh, there will be a number of changes made to it, but we did point that out. If the law was in fact passed, such people that were on MEC plans would be prohibited from receiving subsidies. We would automatically convert all of our clients and the employees that are currently enrolled in MEC plans, they would be automatically enrolled in an indemnity product because obviously you wouldn't want employees to be enrolled in a plan that might have adverse impact on them when they tried to seek receipt exchange. So um, the obviously we talked about this, the, the legislation is now moved to the Senate for further consideration, adaptation, and ultimately reconciliation. Um, those of you that are, uh, are fond of watching this, um, you know, step by step through the process, probably saw yesterday that the CBO, um, Congressional Business Office, or uh, Budget Office, um, scored the current House version. And I'm seeing different numbers, but the number that probably causes the most concern for most people is that there's anywhere between 15 and 23 million people that would supposedly, according to CBO, lose their coverage as a result of uh, the AHCA uh, in its current form. So it, 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 while it did not have a negative impact on uh, death uh, or you know, um, you know, on the deficit, it did in fact have what the CBO said was a negative impact on people that were actually enrolled in the plan. So we'll just have to watch and see how that progresses. Um, one thing that I want to point out, I, I know that what we often talk about when when we talk about the ACA is um, how these changes will impact impact individual coverage. In other words, those plans that people are purchasing on the exchanges. That's where a lot of the national media focuses their attention. It's obviously where people that don't or that are not offered coverage through their employer, obviously their concern, quite frankly, is around how the law, how this law change will impact them on the individual market. But I think the one thing I want to point out is that while much focus has been um, levied on the change in the individual uh, insurance market, 
Most Americans, 159 million people is estimated, receive coverage from their employers. So I think certainly while there are a number of people that would be impacted on the individual market side, the ACA and reforms of the American or the Affordable Care Act would also have impact on employer-sponsored plans. So let's talk about one of those changes, and, and I, I think it's a pretty significant one. And by the way, this next point I'm, was, I'm gonna make about the essential health benefits, or EHBs, um, that was a, a provision that was added at the last minute. Um, it was added essentially to provide uh, some cover for various states that might want to change the, the elements of the essential health benefits that are contained within the, uh, the Affordable Care Act so that the country wouldn't have this one-size-fits-all policy from coast to, to coast, but rather individual states in their uh, work with their own individual Department of um, Insurance could come up with plans that might not meet the requirements that are currently in place. In other words, um, a state might decide uh, of the 10, of the 10 uh, essential health benefits that are currently in the ACA, uh, and I'll just give you a few of those. All plans that are currently offered through the exchanges have to, and through employer-sponsored plans, have to have inpatient care, inpatient hospital care, and that needs to be unlimited. So there's no limit to the amount of claims liability, uh, and that's one of the 10 essential health benefits. Another one is um, mental health care, um, and, and uh, the others are things like uh, prescription drug coverage, coverage for, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? for um, no, no, not the um, the uh, the um, <laughs> uh, con contraceptions. Yes, thank you, Bill. Um, so there, the the federal law as it reached reads today, if a plan is going to be a qualified plan, it must have all ten of these essential health benefits. But what this current AHCA provides for are waivers that would permit employers to benchmark to any other state, including the states that might have received waivers. So I'll give an example. Um, let's say that Georgia um, has passed and they, uh, uh, requested, and that waiver says that mental health is not required um, as part of uh, essential health benefits. So if Georgia decides that, then the state of South Carolina could apply for a similar waiver and benchmark their plan against Georgia's. And thus, while employers or while insurance companies would still have to offer a plan that has all 10 essential health benefits in it, the state could also approve plans that don't necessarily have all those 10, but rather would only measure up to the waivered uh, provision that the state was approved for. So for instance, an employer's plan in South Carolina after that waiver was approved might not have to contain mental health, um, uh, health benefits. And so what this does, this manipulation of EHBs, um, it, what it does is it actually allows for an employer to, uh, for, to develop plans that impose limits or might um, eliminate out-of-pocket caps. Um, the question really remains is, will employers in fact pursue these waivers? Obviously some will, um, many won't, but it will be a matter of competitive pressure, quality benefits, the, 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 the quality benefits to attract employees versus looking for ways to lower cost. And we all know what a delicate balance and a delicate dance that is. We always want to try to balance um, providing quality benefits, but they also, uh, you know, as an employer, you're also looking for ways to minimize your financial exposure. So that's just one example of how um, 
the current version of the America or the uh, AHCA uh, does provide for this uh, uh, maybe a not not a one size fit all, but rather a state specific um, uh, standard. For instance, the the other things we need to look at uh, as this bill goes into the Senate, and there are a number of things, and I won't cover all of them in, in great deal, but the way this bill is being addressed, and you probably have heard this word until you, you're sick of hearing it, is the reconciliation process, budget reconciliation. And as, as the words kind of indicate, um, they're dealing with this law and the changes to this law as it relates to the federal budget. And they're using that budget reconciliation process um, to ways to make changes to the Affordable Care Act. But because those changes have to be related to the budget um, and any other topic that is not, quote, budget related or that would have a, a financial um, impact on law, um, then a budget reconciliation measure can't include things that don't have things to do with the budget. So, for instance, changing policy. Um, that don't necessarily have an impact on the budget probably wouldn't be allowed during the reconciliation process. And we'll talk a little bit about um, how that all gets sorted out in a, a few minutes. The, the other thing we have to consider is as we, as we move this bill from the House where it's been passed into the Senate where it will get reshaped, if you will, is we got to consider that every state or most states have these risk pools. Um, before the Affordable Care Act came along, every state essentially had um, a, 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 risk, a state risk pool that was set aside for those people that had significant existing preconditions that prohibited them from being able to get coverage. So let's say that I had um, you know, just some very rare disease and for whatever reason I couldn't get coverage through uh, the regular market. Well, you know, these state pools uh, allowed for people to participate in those pools and gain coverage even though they had these significant health uh, problems. Um, this analysis of how the AHCA is going to be handled um, will have a big impact on these state risk pools, so we'll just need to keep an eye on that. Um, obviously, we talked about the efforts to eliminate um, the essential health care our health benefits uh, packages um, could touch a lot of people as we talked about uh, just a few minutes ago. And then of course, the, there's another office within the Senate called the, the Parliamentarian Office and that's the, this is, think about them as being kind of a consulting group to the Senate. And this group, this office is um, typically staffed with very efficient, very intelligent people that have years of experience and understanding how uh, the sausage is made in Washington, and you can see that the recent bill, uh, the budget, the recent budget actually awarded the Senate parliamentary a budget of just shy of two million, two billion dollars. So there's certainly a lot of um, a lot of uh, money at stake to make this process very uh, thorough. So I don't sense this is going to have, as I mentioned earlier. A, a, a quick path. I think this will be studied uh, 10 ways to Sunday. So, um, and the other thing we have to consider as this law passes in, in its current form, there's some significant changes to Medicaid funding. And um, obviously there's a lot of Republican governors, some who have expanded Medicare in their states in order to uh, secure uh, state exchanges, but there's a number of them that have not expanded Medicaid those that have expanded Medicaid are depending upon Medicaid dollars to continue to fund those, those state Medicaid uh, programs. And uh, obviously, if there are cuts to that, then that would have significant impact on them and the uh, residents of their state. So I think the, the message right now in a, in a kind of a concise uh, method or statement would be keep an eye on this. We really don't know where the direction is going. We know that there's going to be a significant fight in the Senate. 
Um, there's a number of things that we can point to that are going to simply make this more difficult. Um, mainly the fact that there is a very, very close majority uh, for the Republican Party in the Senate. So they can't essentially lose anyone and get this bill passed. So if they lose Republican senators, you can forget about this thing. It'll, it'll, it'll go in the, in the trash. Um, so let, let's, let's bring this home to kind of some of the aspects of the ACA um, that really do hit home for you guys. Um, as we mentioned, the law is the law until it's not, and that also applies to the 2017 reporting is expected just like it has been in the past. So just because we got a new president that is, you know, pretty committed to changing the Affordable Care Act, um, everything that we're hearing says that the reporting will continue, the ACA year-end compliance reporting will continue uh, as it always has. Uh, there's no information currently being uh, shared on any kind of form changes or code changes. Uh, there's no information uh, on this best effort relief or filing extensions that we've had in the past. If you remember back in 2015, uh, well, back in 2016 when we were reporting for 2015 for the first time, they, the, the IRS had announced this uh, best effort approach, um, uh, you know, if you do the best you can kind of thing. Well, that didn't exist for 16 reporting. It certainly doesn't look like it's going to be uh, any kind of relief provided for 17 reporting. Um, of course, the uh, Treasury inspector audits, um, it, it, we're understanding they're going to be pushing to begin penalty collection. Um, the only collections that we've been able to see any kind of substantial activity in is in the area of individual penalty collection. And that only seems to be occurring when an individual voluntarily states that they were non-compliant on their 1040. So if you filed your individual, individual taxes and on your tax return you stated that you did not have a compliant plan in place for 2016, then chances are you were penalized and the way that penalty worked was it was reduct that that penalty was reduced out of whatever tax return you might have received. So, um, uh, you know that that appears to be the only penalty collection that's occurring now on the individual side. Um, we we understand that there's going to be some renewed effort to start sending employer invoices out to those companies that have not been compliant with the Affordable Care Act. So if you are an employer with greater than 100 full-time employees on payroll at any one given time and an average over the year, then, and if you did not offer an ACA compliant plan, there's certainly an opportunity that you could be receiving an invoice from the IRS. Um, the employee form 1095, just, uh, just to get this on your calendars, those are due January 31st, 16, or excuse me, 18, uh, January 31st, 2018. And then, of course, the IRS 1094 summary, which are nothing more than a consolidation, if you will, of the 1095s, those are due March 31st, March 31st, 2018. So um, that's kind of where, you know, that's what you need to be uh, benchmarking towards. Uh, if we see any changes in this area, we'll certainly um, release a press release on it. Uh, if we see anything changes, this reporting in any way changes those dates, or um, if they were to reinstitute a, a best effort, or, um, we would certainly let everyone know that, but you certainly shouldn't plan on it. Um, the, the 27 reporting, um, Let's think about how, if between now and in January of, of next year, it would be an absolute miracle if the Senate could get something passed between now and then. But let's assume that they did. And what what would happen if the lawyers or the in and or the individual mandates were eliminated? What would be the need for reporting? And again, this is not. Uh, 
this is nothing more than a rhetorical question for you to think about. Uh, I, I think there's a, a reasonably good expectation that one would have that says, if those two mandates were removed, there, there essentially would be no reason for reporting, but until we hear, we have to uh, comply. Um, again, the impact on employers, um, does, does, does this change in the American Healthcare Act? Uh, how does it possibly open up issues for other ERISA plans, for instance, self-funded plans? Many of you are utilizing self-funded plans. For the most part, the things we see on the exchange are all fully insured plans, um, and obviously these changes would have an impact on those, but because self-funded plans are employer-sponsored plans that are essentially created by the employer, um, you know, how will this law uh, in, in its passage of impact those plans? Um, are there any relevant changes to actuarial value? I think most of you know that, you know, the the minimum value plans that have been offered in the staffing industry for the last couple of years have been 60% actuarial value. Well, as part of the Senate debate, will there be some recalculation or reconsideration of actuarial values? If there were, would that mean that the price of plans might be reduced? These are the kind of things we have to look towards as this moves through its, um, you know, through the process. Um, one of the other things is we hear a continuous talk around is, you know, should we revisit the definition of full time? Um, I scratched my head when this law first came out and said that all of a sudden, you know, 30 hours a week was was full time. And certainly for as long as I've been around, it's always been the, the threshold of 40 hours a week was always seen as, um, as a full time employee. So imagine how if the definition were to change from 30 hours a week to 40 hours a week, that may very well uh, reduce the impact of this law on staffing companies, for instance. Um, and what about uh, relief requirements that are not amended into ERISA? So these are all the kind of things that we have to look at, um, pay close attention to as this uh, bill works through um, the Senate. Where is it going? Who the heck knows? But no matter what happens, there's going to be an impact on the staffing industry. And so uh, carriers like uh, or brokers like us, um, we're having to create plans for multiple uh, eventual outcomes. Um, we've got to understand that if if the mandate goes away, for instance, on this person, if the point goes away, will employers still offer benefit? We'll talk a moment in, in we'll talk a few minutes um, about how important benefits are. I think we all know that the marketplace, uh, the available workforce, is, is it's increasingly more difficult to find qualified applicants. I, I think that's a, a story that we hear almost every day. And I just can't imagine employers stopping offering benefits simply because the government says you don't have to. Um, if the individual mandate goes away, will employees still be interested in benefits? And I, we, we think they will be, and I'll point to a couple reasons why. Um, but what type of plans will staffing fir firms offer to be competitive? That's another thing we have to keep in mind. And let's face it, this industry is highly competitive. So you have to do and offer the kinds of services and benefits that will keep you uh, competitive in your own individual marketplace, or you have a challenge recruiting the talent that you need to satisfy your client's needs. And how much are staff employees willing to pay for benefits? Um, obviously, this is an industry that, uh, for much of its history, didn't offer benefits at all. Uh, we like to think that we helped pioneer, if you will, the introduction of, of benefits being offered in the, uh, in the staffing industry. And, and we did so originally with the idea of competitiveness. Do you really, do you, are you competitive? Are you competitive with your, uh, your staffing uh, competitors in your own marketplaces? And by not offering benefits, you found that it, it, you weren't, in fact, competitive. So uh, I, don't, I don't sense that 
uh, that will go away, that people will continue to offer benefits. Now, and this is why employees will still have a great deal of interest in insurance products. Um, most applicants in the staffing industry, and this has been ferreted out by um, staff history analysts and others, that a typical applicant is, you know, essentially one medical uh, emergency away from financial ruin or bankruptcy. Um, and then we turn to Milliken and, or Milliman and others to look at proof in that regard. 84% of workers have an annual health insurance claim of under $5,000. Why is that significant? Well, if you have a minimum value plan and you have a $5,000 deductible, that you've essentially, um, you've incurred cost of under $5,000, therefore all of those claims have been paid by you, the individual, because your deductible hasn't been met or your insurance carrier is not paying yet. So uh, just something to keep in mind. And then um, CNBC stated that 69% of Americans have less than $1,000 in their savings account. Well, how does that match? with medical bills uh, less than $5,000 when in fact they have $1,000 in their savings account. And then NBC News stated that Americans have less than $500 in savings, 34% have no savings at all. Well, you can see at the bottom, that's why we think that the financial squeeze at the top is the top reason why employees need affordable voluntary benefits the kind of benefits that are often seen in plans like the essential staff care plan because those plans don't have deductibles, they don't have co pays they don't have waiting periods. Therefore, they're used to fill the gaps where major medical plans fall short. So just keep in mind that these are some of the numbers that are driving. Um, and then you can business to recruit. So let's see what some of the recruiting um, surveys have looked like. Employee Benefits Research Institute says that 79 or 76 percent of applicants report that health benefits are often, uh, if they're offered, is extremely important or very important to their decision of accepting a job. Now, is this a survey of staffing companies? I don't know. I doubt it. I think there's probably some that are included in it. Maybe it focuses more on traditional employers, but the fact is, um, 76% of applicants surveyed said that benefit packages were a very important part of their decision-making process to accept a job. One medical survey, 69% say they might choose one job over another uh, if one offers better benefits. Well, I mean, I think that kind of stands um, uh, to reason, if you will. Now, before we go to the next slide, I want, to, I want you to think about um, We've actually done some studies that retention um, is tied directly with satisfaction of your employee. If an employee is being offered benefits, they're more satisfied at their job. Um, and you can see that you can see in these various surveys where 88% of employees offered benefits were very satisfied with their, um, or they, that was important to them. 61% that said that their company's benefits were, were they were satisfied with them. So you can see that this is on the forefront, if you will, of applicants' minds. Now, this is, this is where we want to share some information that's kind of proprietary to us. We're in a new, unique position where we can look at the payroll data of staffing companies. We know who's enrolled and we know who's not. And what we've been able to determine is those employees that are enrolled in benefits stay 57% longer than those that don't take benefits. And we're, we're currently in the process of building a, pro, a, a an estimator, if you will, a calculator that will show how, how much more profitable will your company be if you're able to retain employees on your payroll for longer periods of time. And, and, and you know, I know that there's an immediate thought when if someone only stays 12 weeks and if you, you have a certain level of, of, of profitability, but if you could get someone to stay 36 weeks, 
how much more profitable is your company because you didn't have the hard dollar cost to recruit, screen, background checks, drug testing, all those things on a new applicant, and not to mention by not having to fill that position again and again and again, it, it frees your recruiters up to focus on um, you know, expanding the new business, not having to just churn people if you can get people to stay longer. And I think each of you in your own way have identified how if someone stays on your payroll longer, you're more profitable as a result of it. So um, those are kind of the things that I think drive recruiting, retaining, and your increased revenue. I think that is uh, probably the bottom line of this post-ACA. Regardless of what happens, you've got to recruit the right talent. You want to have them satisfied while they're on your payroll by offering qualified benefits. And if those two things are achieved, someone stays on your payroll longer, the end result is you uh, have a net increase in your, in your profitability. So um, that's kind of the conclusion. Um, we do have a couple of questions uh, that we would like to ask, so I'm going to kick it back to Amanda. And um, I don't know how this part works, Amanda. Okay, uh, so, so I've I'm gone ahead have... and opened up our first poll. If you can go ahead and answer a yes or no question, if the employer mandate goes away, will employers still offer benefits? We'll leave it open for about 15 more seconds. Okay, my, my poll results are coming back with uh, an overwhelming yes. Well, that's good news. Thank you, Amanda. We have a and second it, poll question. Of, Do you want us to go ahead and release that? Uh, if you would, please. Sure. Okay, so I'm going ahead and um, opening the second poll, which is if the individual mandate goes away, will employees still be interested in benefits. You can go ahead and enter yes or no. Just closing out here. Okay, so I, I have more of a split on this one. I have 71% say yes and 29% say no. Okay, okay. Well, that, uh, again, those are just things that we certainly were interested in hearing what the, the opinion of the audience is. And would love to open this up. We've, we've allowed for some time for questions and um, I don't know how are these where we will people will uh, uh, write them to you or will they is this where people can verbally ask questions? How will that work, Amanda? Uh, you can go ahead and submit your questions through either the Q and A feature or the chat feature, and then I'll read them off and allow um, Alan to answer the questions. I do have a couple that have come in, so I will start this off. Where do you think the reform of ACA is heading? Yeah, um, well, I wish I had a little shiny crystal ball on my desk where we could, uh, where we could, um, you know, really understand where it's going. Here's where uh, I don't know the direction it's going, but here are some of the factors that I think are going to muddy the water. Um, I think this fight in the Senate will be significant. Um, I think we will, uh, uh, I think we will, you may not even see this voted on in 2017. Uh, if it goes to eight, 2018, then we are starting to bump up against elections and often re-elections, and I think that will further hamper 
the, uh, the advance of this bill. Um, and that's not to say that it couldn't pass in, in 19 or 20, but this was something that was certainly a big part of uh, President Trump's agenda. And if it doesn't get um, passed in 17, I think a lot of people will look at that as a failure on his part. There's also another, there's another thought process. And, and this one is the one that I think is very uh, possible. If this isn't dealt with, this bill isn't dealt with, and some bill passed to replace it, the Republicans may very well be just as satisfied to let this thing die a real ugly, painful death. Um, and therefore, they could go and then, uh, you know, the message tried to change it, but, uh, you know, we're sorry you're getting 50% increases in your premiums, but uh, we tried, but nobody on the Democratic side would help us, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, you know, that's a possibility. And then the other thing I think is also very possible is the focus simply, simply shifts from repeal and replace of Affordable Care Act to tax reform. Because the tax reform has to be achieved in order for the economy to get stimulated. So um, this this may just simply fall by the wayside if we don't get it passed in 17, or at least for the near near term. Okay. Uh, another question: If the current House version of the AHCA becomes law, how do you see that changing plan options? Yeah, and, and this goes back to this uh, this employer mandate. Um, I think that if the if the AHCA was passed and it didn't have employer mandate in it, um, I could see where employers, particularly those in the staffing industry, may choose to stop offering plans that require an employer mandate. Um, I think that you might see uh, staffing companies going back to just offering indemnity products and things of that nature, freeing up the applicant if you will to go to the exchange and purchase plans there. Um, but we'll also uh, we'll also see a lot of hybrid plans. I think we're going to see continued growth in the area of self-funded plans. Um, those self-funded plans may not rise to the level of minimum value plans. But again, we have to wait and see what maneuvers in the Senate will possibly impact the actuarial values of these plans. So until we start seeing the negotiations and debate in the Senate, we really are left without a clear picture of the direction it's going. So I wish, again, we had a clear view, but we don't. We know one thing that Democrats and Republicans cannot agree on virtually anything at this time, which is unfortunate. What okay. other questions have any we got, other, Amanda? Uh, if we have any other questions, go ahead and submit them now. As um, we're waiting for additional questions to come in, I'm going to open up our final poll. Uh, if you can give us your feedback on today's webinar. Um, I will also go ahead and put up our contact information if you would like to um, contact Alan directly for additional questions that's more specific to um, your circumstance, um, or if you'd like to reach out to me for any reason, our contact information is available. We will also have a recording of the um, presentation available on our website, um, should you like to share that with anyone. Um, do you have any final thoughts or information that you'd like to share um, to the staffing owners that might be on the call today on, on what you think would be um, good steps for them to take as they're moving forward? Yeah, I, I, that's, that is, I think, an excellent question. Um, I can't stress that this is the law until it's not. Um, do the things that you've done in the past to, to be compliant with the law. Um, make sure that you're, you know, that you're getting an accept or decline from all your applicants. Uh, or, you know, whatever your process is, um, make sure that you're, when someone is eligible for benefits, that you get a yes or a no. Make sure that you're 
systems are up to date and you got clean data because that's going to be really important when it comes reporting time. Um, I think this reporting, if it doesn't change, um, I mean, I think we all can agree it's very complex. Um, we have a couple of partners that can assist employers in their preparation of their ACA reporting year-end, ACA reporting. Um, the things we can hope for in that regard is maybe they somehow make it simpler or simplify the process. We'll have to see. We have gotten no indication that they're planning to do that, but we can always hope. Um, if, if you're not ACA compliant, if, again, if you're over that uh, 50 full-time employees, um, you've got a, you know you've got a significant uh, exposure. Uh, reach out to a carrier, get a plan in place. Um, I think at this stage, most companies know if they're uh, offering compliant plans, or they've they've certainly studied a strategy around ACA compliance. If there's any questions, then you you know, you'd love to just sit down and talk. We'd be happy to help in any way we can. Um, you know, we uh, certainly look forward to meeting you, those of you at, at upcoming um, trade shows and whatnot. So, um, you know, anything we can do to help you here uh, at Essential Staff Care, we'd be happy to. Um, but stay compliant, stay engaged in the process. Um, if you hear rumblings that concern you, write your senators, write your congressmen. Um, those are all activities that you can, I mean, the, this law has an enormous impact on employers in the staffing industry. So you can't disregard it. It's, uh, it, it, it is something that could, uh, could really have a negative impact on your, on your company's financial position if you find yourself in a non-compliant position. So. Um, if we can help in any way, let us know. Great. Well, thank you very much. I don't see that any other questions have come in, uh, okay. but again, if you have any questions, please go ahead and submit them uh, or contact us by phone or email offline. Um, so we'll go ahead and close things out. I'd like to thank all of our participants as well as Alan for sharing um, all of your knowledge on ACA impact for the staffing industry. Again, we'll have a recording of the presentation on our website at tricom.com under our resources tab. Um, thank you again for your participation and watch for information on our next webinar session. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.